to Dr. Fred Califf from NASA JPL. He is a uh, science systems engineer and planetary geologist. Uh, he works on several Mars rover missions, uh, the Curiosity and the Perseverance, and he's tracking uh, the rovers and and gonna he's gonna give us a great presentation and talk all about it. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna hand it over to Fred and let him uh, share a screen and talk all about it. Sounds good. Thanks, Nick. Okay, I assume you can see my screen? Yep, great, hey, great. thank you. Uh, I just wanna uh, say uh, thank you to uh, LA County uh, bringing me on to LA GIS Day. Uh, uh, despite all the space work I do now, I started my beginning working at the state and county level. I was doing transportation uh, road planning in Massachusetts and um, mapping voting precincts in Ohio, mapping coal bed thickness in West Virginia. Uh, so my GIS background is actually kind of diverse, but I've taken all those skills and now I apply them to Mars. Uh, so when we uh, think about mapping another planet, you really have to take everything you learned about mapping and go all the way back to the basics. So, oh yeah, by the way, there's the rover landing, uh, which we hope will it's gonna happen very nicely on February 18th uh, coming up, so uh, stay tuned. So, uh, so you wanna map Mars and the question is, what do you need to know? Well, let's start with the basics. Which way is up? Now, that seems like a silly question. You go, well, I drop a ball and the opposite direction is the other way and you all point to the sky. But is it, right? So let's look at the shape of the earth. Now we think of earth as this perfect sphere and, uh, and, re and up is based on the gravity of your local area, uh, but the Earth is not is not like this perfect uniform thick sphere. It actually has different masses that are concentrated in some areas, like you know near mountains or certain continents. So this this is like an extended, um, an exaggerated gravity model. So you can kind of see it's like you took a clay ball and you kind of gripped it a little bit and you squished it. Um, that's the reality. So gravity, the version of up, is different at different places. Now, the same thing is true on Mars. Mars is basically a spherical planet. However, it does have these certain mass concentrations and that changes the gravity vector. So where we think of up on Mars as well as Earth um, depends on the gravity field. Um, so that helps you, you, know, you have to decide like elevation because you can be elevation based on this perfect sphere or elevation based on the gravity field, which is really what you want to use because that's how water would collect on a proverbial um, location on Mars. So which way is up? Also, which way is north? Um, seems like something really like, oh, it's towards the poles. Well, that's what we've decided it to be. Um, you know, some maps actually show, um, ancient maps show north as being towards what we consider the South Pole. Now, a lot of this, you know, our general standard that we accept is that as the planet spins, um, you know, about an axis, uh, that is what we consider north. Um, there's also the case that all the planets basically travel in this large plane. We call it the ecliptical plane. Um, it's kind of like a tabletop that all the planets kind of circle around on. Uh, but not all planets have this um, direction of the pole oriented up. Um, for example, um, Uranus on the right uh, actually has it tilted to, uh, apologies there, let me go back one. Um, actually has it tilted below the ecliptic plane. So what end of, of Uranus is north is actually kind of just how we decide. And it also depends on which way the planet spins. So again, these are somewhat arbitrary determinations that we have to decide um, which way is north. Okay, um, so we decide you know, what is up, what is north, but then how do you measure things on the planet? And so we think of you know, longitude latitude is generally this um, set of coordinates that we, um, use, but why do we use them? Well, it goes all the way back to um, an ancient Sumerian number system, which is 4,000 years old. That is base 60. Now our normal numbers that we think about is like base 10, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. We have 10 fingers, um, but earlier systems were base 60 and they're um, easily dividable by a bunch of numbers, uh, six and 12 um, and 30. And, and so they're good for decimals. And 
basically the Greeks like Hipparchus um, divided up these ideas of longitude lines, dividing the, the sphere into 360 degrees. Um, and then Aristides developed this, the ideas of latitude. And so the whole idea of degrees and, you know, are all based on this, this a 4,000 year old number system. Why did we choose that one? Kind of arbitrary. However, this is the one we've choose for earth and we use that same thing on Mars and actually all the uh, other terrestrial and, and non-terrestrial planets because um, they're all essentially spheres. Okay, so where are you on Mars? On earth, we have this really cool thing called global positioning systems, right? We've been to satellites flowing around the planet. Um, we can use those and the timing between all those satellites to locate ourselves precisely in three dimensions on the earth. Uh, on Mars, uh, not so much. We don't have GPS on Mars. Oops. Uh, there is no GPS on Mars. So we actually wind up going back to old cartographic methods of actually locating um, features that we see from orbit on the ground and compare them to features that we see on images from the ground, basically matching rocks to rocks. Um, despite uh, all the high tech that we use, we actually go back to some pretty basic cartographic standards to find out where we are um, on the surface. And of course, you know, uh, projections, um, they're complicated, um, but we all, you know, we're used to working with maps um, on Mars. Uh, we use the same projection standards, you know, um, orthographic, conical, cylindrical maps, uh, you know, Mercator, um, orthographic, uh, and all and all that, Albers. Um, the key part is the size of the planet. So basically, you have to go all the way back to your datum and establish a new datum on, and on Mars, we've done that. So we need to know the radius of the planet um, and the number that I have burnt into my brain uh, besides um, 63,360 inches per mile um, and 2.54 um, centimeters per inch um, is uh, 3,396,190 meters. That is the um, equatorial radius uh, on Mars. And we use that to establish a spherical datum on Mars um, compared to Earth. So it's about, you know, it's a little over 50% um, the, the radius of Earth. Um, in the Earth one, I, I, I don't memorize because I mostly don't work there. Well, I work there, but I don't do maps there. Um, in any case, so, um, so all really all I have to do is we use the same type of map projections we use uh, a different spherical radius, and then everything works out. Okay, so uh, you know, uh, you know, we originally started with telescopic observations of Mars, and now we, uh, like on Earth, we have um, orbiters, satellites, which go around the planet, and we use those um, to collect data, collect images on the ground. So this is a variety of spacecraft we sent out to Mars. Um, Mariners uh, four, six, nine, um, the Viking uh, orbiters, and um, a lot of more modern ones like uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is kind of our workhorse now, collecting uh, imagery um, from the surface. But we also have now, um, since uh, the late 1990s, put um, uh, spacecraft on the ground. Um, the first rover, uh, uh, Sojourner and then the uh, MER Exploration Rovers and uh, Curiosity, which is on the surface right now, still working, and Perseverance, which is coming up. Um, so the good thing about collecting data from orbit is that um, over time, we've sent more and more spacecraft, and thereby we're getting more and more data. So back in the 70s, we basically had the Viking orbiter, and we kind of had like some visible imagery and a little bit of thermal data. Um, so we could tell like sand from rocks, uh, but now, you know, uh, current times we have um, all that old older data as well as uh, newer data um, all the way down to uh, uh, 25 centimeter per pixel um, satellite imagery. And basically, you know, we've uh, sent the spy satellite to Mars or uh, the equivalent of what was it Sentinel or uh, uh, Quick Eye or, or, or I can't remember quite the names of the, the Earth ones. Um, so basically we can see um, laptop sized um, objects on Mars. Um, it's pretty cool that way. Now, not the whole planet. Um, the whole planet we have mapped down to about uh, six meters per pixel, which is pretty good. You know, how size, find how size objects all over Mars. Um, not real houses, not alien houses. We Photoshop all those out. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, how size objects on Mars. Um, but in some areas, we can see all the way down to um, you know, like a desktop or a laptop. Okay. So, 
here's our here's what um, Earth looks like. You know, we've got this night mapping system. Everything's laid out. We see things like you know continents and uh, oceans and such. Now on Mars, a um, little bit different. Um, here is Mars and that same kind of uh, rectangular laundry latitude system. And so at first you go like, okay, um, it's kind of brown. It's kind of, um, don't see a lot of features. But if you start to look around, you start to see things like um, ice caps at the top of, um, uh, to the north and to the south, just kind of like Earth. Uh, there's a large valley, which extends um, uh, um, uh, a large section of the planet called Valles Marineris. It is is like the Grand Canyon of Mars. It goes from basically, it's as long as going from California to New York. Uh, it's huge. You'll see a, little, uh, a lot of um, other spots there, which these are volcanoes. Um, and so, you know, we realize actually there's a lot of, a lot that have gone on on Mars that was like Earth. Um, however, most of that activity was like three to 4 billion years ago, basically kind of in the early stages of the planet. Um, on Earth, most of those rocks are gone. On Mars, they're still kind of preserved because Mars kind of stopped evolving a long time ago. So we go to Mars to study ancient Earth, and that's why it's, we send so many spacecraft there. Okay, so what type of questions do we try to, uh, you know, what do the rover scientists and engineers uh, do at JPL? So we try to answer the questions like, uh, how do you find a safe place that's uh, a safe and scientifically interesting place on Mars that you can land? Um, uh, how do you know where the rover is, uh, where to go? Uh, what do we, how do we collect data on the surface? And then, you know, what do we do with this rover? Where do we, what are our goals? Um, so uh, some of the first things you gotta find out what's scientifically interesting. So we use these satellites, uh, much like on earth to collect uh, spectroscopy to basically measure the, um, the contents of the rocks and the sand on Mars and looking, and we've really been doing the uh, follow the water uh, method. So we're looking for uh, things like clays and salts, which note where there's uh, water on the surface and we map them out to find these interesting places. But then we have to do the engineering part. Um, you know, lots of scientifically interesting places on Mars. Uh, all these blue dots are interesting places. Uh, red dots are, are some other um, sites that we kind of glommed onto. Um, but spacecraft have certain landing capabilities that we have to respect. One, they don't like it when it's cold. So uh, we limit the areas where we can land currently, um, especially for the rovers, between um, 30 degrees uh, north latitude and 30 degrees south. So that's one band of areas you know, that we have to limit to look into. And then we need to low below a certain elevation. This, 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 so we have to land below, I believe it's like minus one kilometers um, on Mars for uh, like curiosity and perseverance uh, rovers. So, uh, so that black mask, that is masking out um, those areas that are above that elevation. And then we don't want to go to areas that are really dusty because dust gets on cameras. Um, if you have a solar panel mission, um, you know, it's going to cover the solar panels, you won't get power. Uh, so those gray areas are areas with very low uh, thermal inertia. So basically very dusty areas. And so that leaves the rest of the area of, of Mars where we have this intersection of safe to land and scientifically interesting. And our new landing site, uh, Jezero Crater, that yellow dot on the right hand side, is where we're going to send a uh, Perseverance rover and Ingenuity, the uh, helicopter. Um, so uh, what is this? This is classic um, site analysis, right? The thing you learn in, um, in school <laughs> with GIS, how do you find a place that meets all these criteria? We do the same thing to select landing sites on Mars. Um, and uh, this is the same map that's just showing elevation with blues are low and, and uh, white is high and red's uh, also high. Um, these are all the places where we've landed on Mars. Um, we have landed some things that are kind of close to the poles, uh, Phoenix um, and the Viking landers, um, but mostly we kind of stick to the equator because it's kind of a nice area. Um, the Vikings there, Sojourner, um, Curiosity rovers, Murray rover, and then uh, Perseverance coming up to Jezero. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, we map all the things, right? Uh, so when we want to land, we want it to be very safe. Uh, you know, all the landings happen are automated. They are, you know, we have, um, when you get out to Mars, you're either between um, uh, eight minutes and 20 minutes communication time. Uh, so we can't like joystick the rover. We can't guide the spacecraft to the surface. We have to have it do it automatically. So we have to find very safe places on Mars. So we take these high resolution um, uh, imagery, which we 
uh, use to take stereo pairs to create orthophotos. From there, we create elevation models. From there, we create slope hazards. We count rocks. And then we get to, um, we basically statistically see where is it safe to land on Mars. Uh, so we're combining all these data sets together to find these uh, safe places to land, as well as um, map out these scientifically interesting places to go. So, uh, so just some context. So I'm going to talk about the, the new landing site that we've picked, uh, Jezero Crater, uh, in that little blue circle there. And this is a close-up view. So it's a an, an impact crater, basically from a huge meteorite that impacted on Mars. It's about uh, 50 kilometers across in diameter. And that little blue uh, circle, that is basically what we call the landing ellipse. This is where we're going to land within 99% of the time. Um, and, and where we've determined that it is safe to land. And so you'll kind of, if you if you squint a little bit, you notice to the left, there's this river valley, which cuts into um, the crater. And then there's this broad thing here. We think this is a river delta. And basically we think this whole crater was flooded as a lake. And then there's another delta, uh, another uh, stream that went out um, where the water exited. So so we feel like this is a uh, was a long-term lasting lake about, uh, three to four billion years ago. And it's filled with um, sediments. We see things that are clays and things that rocks that are, um, um, were deposited by water. And so we, we are hoping to find um, actually evidence of ancient life on Mars. Um, we're gonna actually um, go there. We're gonna collect um, rock samples. We have, a, we have a coring drill that's gonna drill into rocks, collect samples that we think might contain uh, ancient fossil life, not current life, um, Mars surface is pretty uninhabitable right now. Um, it's minus 80 um, Fahrenheit on a good day. Um, and uh, there's no liquid water on the surface. Um, the atmosphere is um, six thousandths um, of ours. So there's basically no atmosphere. It's a very inhospitable place. However, three, four billion years ago, we think it was actually more Earth-like. So that's what we're kind of see if life may have developed on this planet. So, um, you know, so what do we do? We collect this satellite imagery. Um, we stitch them together into mosaics. Uh, you know, this is a little close up view of that delta and that valley coming in. And so that black circle is basically where we're gonna land and these other um, little squares are just things that are scientifically interesting. So we get the, the visible map and then we look even closer. So now we're getting down to these, you know, so the scale bars here are 50 meters um, for the most part. So we zoom in these maps and we look for geologically interesting things like layers in the surface, areas where um, rocks form ridges that might be um, veins um, and just kind of dig into that geology. So we know uh, where to go when we land. Um, uh, so again, we, we take the visible data, stereo images, we create these elevation models uh, just like we do on Earth. So here uh, the blues are low and the, uh, the reds and browns are high. Um, and like everything, like we need to be able to not just give coordinates, but we give things names. Um, so we can call them. So it's kind of just like, you know, like we're explorers, we, we name places where we want to go. And usually we, we use names from earth. We don't make things up. So if we have things like Belva Crater, Hartwell Crater, Decano Crater, these are all um, pulling from names of um, earth-based locations. Um, but then we do the next step, you know, we do the mapping. And so we developed a, uh, a web-based uh, mapping system uh, so that we could, because we have a um, a broad and diverse science team. Uh, they're from uh, all parts of the planet, all different cultures, but we wanted this unified way of um, mapping together. So we had this mapping exercise about a year ago where we basically developed, uh, divided the landing area into these uh, one by one kilometer quads, quadrangles, and then we mapped, each person mapped each one, and then we combined them together um, from the left and then into a, a final map on the right. Um, where we pulled out the main geologic features and noted, you know, where there's sand and where there's rock and things like that. Um, it's important. You get you you need to understand um, where you're going to go and, and why you're going there and where you know where can you reach and where can you not. Um, so it took a look a little bit of the rovers. Uh, so we've uh, basically had um, uh, the, the, yeah. So basically, uh, NASA has developed three different types of rovers. Actually, now four technically. Um, uh, so the first one was Sojourner. So I'm going to just go point a little quickly to that thing that says Prop M. That was actually a, a Russian rover that landed in a Mars 3 in the 1960s. It probably did not deploy. They never really got back a lot of data. But nevertheless, there was this really, really, really early kind of skid hopping rover. Um, 
but the ones that we know worked, um, Sojourner back in the uh, 1997, 98. Um, uh, then there was the Spirit Knock Three Rovers, the two on the on the left there. Those were about like a golf cart size rover. And then we have things that are like the mini SUV, um, uh, Curiosity, which is on the surface now, and Perseverance, which is kind of kind of like a carbon copy. Um, it is slightly bigger. It has different instruments because we've kind of expanded on what we can do. Um, but you know, uh, the height of the uh, the mass, for example, is about um, two meters or about seven feet. Um, so you know, it's a tall thing. <laughs> it's big. It's imposing. Um, by the way, this is in our Mars yard at JPL because you know we, we we can't go to Mars every day, but we do like to drive our rovers around and uh, play in the sandbox, as they say. Okay. Um, so the new rover, Perseverance, um, it, it's kind of like Curiosity. It has a bunch of cameras like MassCam Z on this mass, which we can turn around. It also has a super cam, which is a laser we can use to shoot rocks and get the chemistry. Uh, we have Meta, which is a, um, uh, an atmospheric instrument measuring temperature, pressure um, on the surface. Uh, we have RIMFACS, which actually ground penetrating radar. So as we drive, we're actually going to look at rocks underneath the ground. Um, first time we've done that. Um, from a landed mission, so that'd be kind of fun. Um, then we have a bunch of instruments on the arm, uh, which will, um, we have Pixel and Sherlock, which basically x-ray the rocks and look at their chemistry at a very um, like micron scale, uh, millimeter scale, basically the size of sand grains. Um, and then we have the coring drill, the most exciting part. Um, we can drill the rock, we're gonna extract a sample of the rock, and then we stick it into the caching system inside the rover, it gets put into a tube, and that tube will be dropped on the surface for a future mission to uh, pick up that sample. Uh, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna know where these rocks came from on the surface. Like, so we get actually meteorites from Mars, which land on Earth, and we can tell they're um, from Mars because the, uh, the atmospheric gases trapped in them are just like on Mars, as well as their chemistry. Um, but we don't know where on Mars they are. So they're kind of very out of context and they don't, they help us in some ways understand Mars geology, but they don't tell us everything. Um, so now we'll know precisely down to uh, the centimeter of where these rocks were on Mars and we'll know the geologic environment and thereby understand Mars at a very higher level. Plus we can also throw a bunch of instruments at it that we can't um, send to the planet, um, very high resolution um, microscopes and uh, you know uh, chemical analyses that we can only do on Earth. So we're really excited uh, to bring samples back. Um, and then, uh, of course, we have the Mars helicopter in the upper hand right hand side. So we're actually going to um, fly on Mars um, with this little, um, you know, bi rotor um, copter. It's basically a technology demo. So it's going to fly up a few times and fly around a little bit. Um, but it's basically a way of testing the ability to fly over Mars and um, collect sample, you know, view things that we can't get to with the rover, but we can with the helicopter. So it's uh, pretty exciting. First time. So um, how do we start? So uh, we need to find where the rover is. So we basically are comparing images. So we take the orbital base map we have, and then we collect these um, narrower images of the surface and we co-register them. We use the georeferencing and, and locate them together. Um, and then we sometimes we get descent images and we also get some images with perseverance. And so as the spacecraft gets closer and closer, we co-register them. And this is all for the Curiosity rover, these work that uh, I had done, um, co-register them. And then we were able to later um, image the landing site and actually see where the burn scars were, um, this little dark spot in the middle there. Um, so co-registering this image, we can actually find the rover down to, um, you know, within a few uh, centimeters. So those two little bright patches, those are from the, the landing rockets as they blasted the surface. And actually, if you look, so this image is actually a little bit after landing, because you can see on the right side, there's these two kind of like dark black tracks. Those are the actual imprints of the rover wheels on the surface, those rubber wheels are only about 30, no, 30, 40, 50, 50 centimeters across. So we're literally can track the rover everywhere it goes. Um, and of course we have to tie it to the base map. So we have to compare it to images that we get from space as well as on the ground. Um, so a lot of times I get asked like, what's your favorite image of Mars? And it's this really blurry one in the upper left. So when we first land on Mars, we take images in front of us and back of us. And the one in front um, uh, is, you know, it's this blurry, there's like a little patch of gray, a, a black line across the top. And then there's this white hump. Um, before we landed, I created this um, 3D scene um, 
to show what would the different views would be like from the center of the landing lips. And it basically matched this one view um, that I had simulated with the GIS data. And so I was able to predict, um, and also based on the sun angle because the shadow of the rover that we were like um, uh, roughly about 108 degrees. And I was like, ah, oh, plus or minus five. And the actual was 112 and I was uh, pretty happy. Um, but again, this knowing the mapping context, getting the, you'd be able to just visualize what it looks like potentially on the ground and then matching it was a, a, a pretty cool thing. Uh, but then, you know, we get data on the ground and now here are actual images from Mars. You can see the shadow of the rover in the bottom. You can see the blast marks from landing on the right. This is Mars. This is what it looks like. This is, you know, as if you were standing there, um, you know, kind of desert-like. Um, you know, we take these images and then we have to map them onto our, onto our maps and then see, you know, what do we see at these highest details? Uh, you know, and we go visit these geologic formations that we have mapped, um, you know, sandstones and mudstones and look at the interfaces between the two on the ground and then put them together into this context. So we're driving um, over the length of the mission, you know, tens of kilometers, um, which it doesn't seem like a lot on Earth, but on Mars, it's huge. Um, the first mission only drove um, a few tens of meters. Um, and then our next missions um, drove like seven kilometers. And then it was 14 kilometers, oh, no, sorry, 40 Oh, I should know this number exactly, uh, 46 kilometers. Um, right now at Curiosity, we're a little over 20. Uh, you know, so we're, we're driving these long distances and we have to put all that geology together and we do it with maps. Um, but, you know, we map things at this kind of, you know, kilometer, you know, city scale and city block scale. But we get down to things like, we wanna know where every place where we shot the laser um, on the surface. We want to see where all these microscopic images, which are measuring, you know, sand that we can see sand grains on, on the surface. So um, we spend a lot of our time, uh, we call it localizing, finding out where all these science products were occurred. So we can actually show where they overlapped and then you can compare chemistry for, and, and mineralogy from different instruments. Um, it's uh, very important for us to kind of have this situational awareness of everything that we do on the surface. So what do you do? You answer it with maps. So we do things like map all the places where we have high resolution imagery. Uh, oops, I skipped one there. Um, we map the elevation because we want to do sampling every um, 25 meters of elevation. We make maps of every place where we drilled a hole on Mars and took a sample and all their names and locations along our traverse. And so on the right hand side, that white line is the um, traverse that we've done. And all the red dots are where we've uh, drilled holes. Uh, we make maps just tracking the rover every day to day. Um, what day, you know, what number um, uh, Martian day are we on? What Sol, uh, 1691 in that time of the mission? Where does that relate to everything else we've done? Um, and then down to this level of, you know, the sand grain level, you know, I like to say that we map from space to sand at all the scales. So here we're now at the rover scale, um, looking at these rocks up close and, and doing different types of analyses with different instruments. And then looking at the three contexts of like, a far zoomed out local a regional view to a very local view to even an oblique view at the bottom there where we're actually seeing in the view of the camera of um, as if you were standing on the surface. All of these are important from a geology perspective um, to understand what, you know, what's going on. Um, and then, you know, we combine all that data together to um, inform this you know, back to the broader scale of the geologic maps and where we've been and, um, you know, what we're seeing and then what's coming ahead. What, what, you know, as we climb up, uh, our mountains and such, well, where are we gonna go? You know, and then we can even take that into mapping at the geolog, you know, at the rover scale. So these are strip maps of uh, geology sections that are basically every, all the rocks we could see within view of the rover. And this was specifically um, from uh, Larry Crumpler who worked on the Mars Exploration Rover Mission uh, Opportunity um, as it drove around the surface. Um, and then, you know, we take this and then we, you know, we're mapping in images um, from an oblique view, putting them in the horizontal view and then reconstructing 3D models of how we think the geology actually looks. Um, but, you know, we've gone from a tail, we've really, uh, as mapping has evolved from static maps to interactive maps, we have done the same. And so now we have a, a, a web-based system that we use uh, a framework and for the, uh, the real, uh, for the map programmers out there, um, use a combination of Leaflet and 3JS and things like D3 and, you know, jQuery and all that stuff. Um, combine them together so that we have a mapping application that actually pulls together three different views and we call it uh, MMGIS, which is Multi-Emission Geographic Information System. It is um, an open source project we've open sourced and actually out on GitHub 
um, that you can actually go and download yourself and use, um, albeit with a little bit of a technical um, expertise. Um, so basically we have this, you know, a central map, classic 2D view. We combine that with a three-dimensional view and an in-situ um, on the ground view um, so that we can show where the rover has been, um, where it's done science. And then at the bottom there, you can see we're actually, we link to uh, science results in this case, uh, oxides of uh, different minerals. Um, so we kind of, so we're not just mapping where we are, but where we did things and then what are the results we get so we can answer um, science questions rapidly. Okay, um, I think I still have enough time. Uh, I'm gonna play a little bit of this video, just kind of showing the software in action. So I can get it going. There we go. Um, so I'm probably gonna skip around the video a little bit, but just show that we can do common things like how far are things away? And so we have, you know, measurement tools to measure distances and angles. Um, we also automatically have it generate um, cross-sectional profiles along distances that we've measured. Um, Cause it, from a geologic context, we need to know, you know, like where do we see a certain result? Um, you know, how, where is silica high? Where is it low? Is it in a layer? Um, you know, simple things of navigation, understanding um, uh, locations of the rover, um, being able to look at different locations and seeing where uh, chemistry results are and aren't. Yeah, skip ahead a little bit. So again, I, um, linking to a ground view, yes? You're good, you were five minutes from your five minute warning. So you're great on time. Oh, okay, great, so I got plenty of time. Awesome, sure. all right, I'll let this uh, play out a little bit then. Um, so here we're actually, um, connecting to um, uh, the ground view and the map view. And so you can see, basically you're show, we're showing targets in two different coordinate systems. One is from the top down view, the kind of the east and north thing of where these locations are. And then on the left, we're actually showing it um, in situ on this mosaic, how we saw that from the ground. Um, so again, these two contexts, we, we pull them together as opposed to having someone look through a bunch of different reports. And then see here, we're clicking on these targets and we're actually grabbing the chemistry data and then graphing it out and being able to sort it. Um, because, you know, uh, as a scientist, you wanna be able to answer questions quickly on the ground. Cause uh, I like to say, um, time is science. Um, you wanna spend more time doing science and less time doing engineering. And by engineering, I really mean mapping. You know, where did this science observation occur? Um, you know, what is the coordinate of the rover system versus the coordinate of the map versus the coordinate of the system of the instruments? They're all different. and I know how to do it, but most scientists, you know, they're chemists, they're geophysicists. Um, it's not their expertise. Um, mapping is an incredible, incredibly specialized um, uh, body of knowledge and not everyone has it. So we're trying to make it, um, we solve that problem for the scientists and engineers so that they can do and ask the next question. Um, not um, where is this observation of high silica, but why is it high silicon? How does that connect with other observations? So again, here's a, a 3D view connected to our 2D view, again, showing where the rovers are, where the rover was, where, where it drove, um, where these science observations are. So all these things are kind of important to provide that, that situational awareness, that scientific context as all good maps should. Okay. Uh, oh, let's keep it going. Yeah, so, um, so besides this, um, this software being open source, we have actually um, now um, uh, made a public uh, facing version. Uh, so you can actually uh, go to uh, mars.nasa.gov forward slash MSL. And then you can uh, go to, uh, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's a really deep here, mission. And then where's the rover? And so we've actually, our MGS software is now live and we update the location of the Curiosity rover uh, every day, giving a little bit of like the drive distance and where it stopped. And we also, um, that little white box, uh, there are a bunch of couple of areas that you can actually um, click on those and link to what we call the surface experience where you can actually um, look around in 3D and see the rover and see, um, see this very, you know, very zoomed in, like as if you're on the surface context. Um, it's a lot of fun. I encourage you to uh, uh, go check it out. Um, we'll have the same thing for Perseverance um, once it lands as well. Um, so, uh, you know, um, how often do we get Mars data uh, every day? Um, so these are some images from Sol 2945 on Mars, which we can also call um, last Tuesday. Um, so, uh, you know, and this is again, looking, you know, 
far out in the distance in the upper left out to the crater rim here. This is Gale Crater um, from some other um, uh, remote uh, microscopic imaging we do all the way down to um, the, the color image there. Sand grains looking at these very fine layers, which are probably only um, millimeters, if that, um, in thickness um, and height difference. So, uh, but you know, we get these images every day and uh, little do people know that these images that come down that we post on the public website, they are often um, there before our scientists look at them. So if you wanna be like some of the first people to see an image on the planet that we've never seen before, uh, <laughs> go to the mars.nasa.gov uh, forward slash MSL site and later for Perseverance. Um, and you can look at fresh images of Mars every day. You can be your own explorer and you know map out um, something we've never, um, a place that we've never visited before. Um, I always find this fascinating. We do, we do cool stuff like that. Um, okay, that's all I have. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, so uh, don't forget, uh, Perseverance um, rover is landing day is February eighteenth, twenty twenty one. You know, come uh, see how it goes. We're hoping for uh, our. You know, we've been four for four. We're shooting for four for five, uh, five for five uh, landings on Mars. Um, yeah, so you can go to uh, Mars and NASA gov and uh, look at all these data and uh, and a lot of these maps that I've shown. Awesome, Fred. This is great. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have some some questions have definitely come in. We have some good questions here, and so um, I think I think we're gonna we're gonna get right to those. Um, so let's do this one. It's uh, first one is how do you determine which sites of interest you visit first? It's a good question. Um, we actually have um, we call landing site workshops. So um, the whole Mars community. I mean, in general, the Mars um, Mars scientists um, are looking at the surface, and they're you know they're looking for cool rocks, right? Um, places where they think there's either water or there's something interesting from a, 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 a interesting volcanism or um, evidence of lakes or evidence of glaciers. And, you know, and they're writing their science papers and they're doing the science, but eventually we go, well, hey, we're gonna build this rover. Um, we wanna put it on the surface, where should we go? And it's one of the things like engineers are like, hey, we wanna go to Mars and scientists say, where can we go? And they go, well, you tell us. So the scientists get together in a meeting, um, at, uh, several meetings. Uh, we had four landing site workshops for the Perseverance rover, and they debate the science. They say, well, you know, here's here's um, here's Gale Crater. Uh, you know, we think we see a five kilometer tall stack of sediments that were put down on a lake. Should we go there? Oh, well, how about Meridiani? Uh, we see evidence of these uh, hematite nodules we think were made by water. Maybe we should go there. And so they basically have that debate, and they, you know, eventually um, there's kind of a voting system um, where people say, you know, which which um, places are most interesting. Sure, okay, great, sounds good. All right, well, let's get another question for you. Uh, it says, so is this uh, an ESA and a NASA collaboration? And the picture that you had with the rovers because they saw a Spain-Norway uh, flag. Too. Yes, uh, I, I uh, pardon me, I forgot to mention. Um, so uh, the rover mission, at least the, the Curiosity mission and the Perseverance mission, um, they are um, run by NASA. However, um, you know, science doesn't stop at our borders and we actually um, have instruments from other science teams. So those flags are showing the country which contributed that instrument. So in the case of RIMFAX, it's a Norwegian flag. Um, the RIMFAX instrument is from, contributed from Norway. Um, uh, you know, ESA, the European Space Agency is kind of like the overriding body. Um, so they kind of, they, they do coordinate with the other countries. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's collaboration with ESA, um, in that sense, um, you know, in Spain, you know, contributed the meta instrument, um, France, the super cam instrument. Um, so, uh, in curiosity, we had, um, uh, uh, the Dan instrument dynamic albedo neutron spectrometer, um, that was from Russia. Um, so we try to pull in, um, you know, instruments from other, um, all around the world so that we can kind of all collaborate and all go to Mars. Cause every time we go there, it's special. Um. Uh, okay. But the, the next mission actually after Perseverance is the Mars sample return. And we are absolutely teaming up with uh, ESA, uh, ESA. Um, they're gonna contribute the rover that will go and fetch the samples and then stick it on a platform which will then shoot into orbit and then bring it back to earth. So we, we work very closely with ESA on all our missions. Great, all right, next question that came in. Um, 
what are the benefits and detriments of using rovers instead of people to explore Mars and what milestones will allow us to put a man on Mars? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so uh, rovers don't need to breathe or eat and they don't want to come home. Uh, they are built. So uh, there used to be this comic, uh, there's this comic that goes around where the Mer rovers were like, they're on Mars and they're lonely and no one speaks to them anymore. Uh, you know, they want to come home. Uh, the rovers don't want to come home. They were built for Mars. Um, that is their home. Um, they are temporarily, they are birthed on Earth, but they, they want to live on Mars. Um, in turn, so, um, but so, so the good thing, they, they don't need to breathe or eat or come home. However, they are very slow um, because of the, you know, we can't joystick the rover live time because of the time delay because it's so far away. So we have to program everything that the rover does and we have to give the rover intelligence. And uh, it's really tricky. We spend all day um, while the rover sleeps programming and checking the programs over and over and over to make sure they will work right. We send that up to Mars, the programs, the rover runs the programs, and then it sends us back data. We do that every, basically every day. Um, it's time consuming. And, you know, um, uh, you know, driving, um, you know, uh, uh, 26 miles on earth. That's like, you know, that's like, okay, that's my commute to work. Right. Um, on Mars, it's incredibly difficult. It takes us years because we have to be time exacting. And, you know, there's no gas stations on Mars. We can't just bring the Rover in to change tire. Um, so there's that, um, in terms of humans, um, the Rovers are showing what the surface is like. We know how to or it lands. We find scientifically interesting places. So we are getting ready. Um, the Rovers give us information to have humans on the surface safe. Um, also, the Perseverance rover will actually is carrying an instrument called MOXIE. MOXIE is going to test taking Martian atmosphere and turning it into oxygen. Um, humans like to breathe, right? <laughs> so um, that is Makes another sense. way that we're prepping for right. um, astronauts. Awesome. Got a few more questions still here, so we want to get to these. Um, this is from Dominique, and she had a question, it was really kind of technical, talked about downloading and using some of your data. I think mm -hmm. we'll follow up with that one separately, but she also said that she has a high school um, in, in our high school GIS and remote sensing class, uh, they mapped Mars and she analyzed the imagery in JMARS. Mm -hmm. Is the tool that you just showed us an updated version of JMARS or is it different? It is different. Uh, JMARS, which is awesome and uh, uh, great to hear that you're using it for your class. It is perfect because it does encapsulate um, all the different Mars data sets in a very um, uh, great to use interface. Um, our interface is, uh, our, the, the tools that we use is slightly different. It's all web-based um, because, you know, we're looking at, we're not looking at individuals working on their own by themselves. We're looking at this large team. So it's more collaborative. Um, our tool also, we don't, um, we populate it with data, but the tool doesn't come with data. So you would need to push data into our tool to map Mars. Um, but however, the tool that we, you know, the version of the tool we just released, you can absolutely use it in your classroom um, to a certain degree. And we can talk about the data sets later. Sure, sounds good. All right, this one came in from Kevin. What drew you to the field and how would, how would someone get into the industry that you're in? Ah, uh, okay. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a geologist by training really, by degree. Uh, I just always like maps and I like exploring. And um, yeah, I think the short answer is I asked. Um, <laughs> you know, I wanted to do this and I asked, you know, I, you know, there were job offers and, you know, I said like, I want to, I want to do planter science. So I asked someone if I could do it and, you know, eventually, eventually <laughs> they said, yes. Um, you know, I went to JPL and they, they said like, Hey, we need someone who knows how to do mapping and landing sites. And I'm like, well, I did some Mars stuff and I know how to map. Can I do it? And yes. And, you know, um, I think the space industry, it's really about asking, you know, yeah. and there's a job, you know, look for job offers, look for internships. Um, you know, uh, it, like I said before, like, I, you know, I, I map voting precincts and roads and watersheds and all sorts of stuff that, I mean, f interesting, fun. Um, but it was developing that mapping capability, which I then applied to Mars, which is really helpful. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if that okay. quite answers your question, but, you know, yeah, ask. no, that's good. I think go, that's go what, for it. yeah, people wanted to know that. And they, I'm, I'm sure other folks wanted to, wanted that as well. All right. Here's another one that came up. Uh, if a drone that accompanying the drone that is accompanying the Rover on its latest mission is successful, do you envision deploying more drones for image capture, sample collections, et cetera, on future missions? Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. Um, uh, 
this is a this is a basic test to see if we can do it and how well it works. Uh, there are definitely other um, uh, things behind the scenes. We'll say um, to develop um, you know bigger helicopters. Um, you know we already have a mission that's going to be going to Titan, which will be a, a quadcopter or an octocopter. I can't remember one of the two. Um, so we're only thinking about drones on uh, other way of the other planets. You know Titan out by Saturn. Sure. Um, but we definitely want to do more on Mars and, and develop that capability because it's it's very um, and, and yes, we are thinking about um, going to collect samples with it, um, taking it, you know, one idea is to you fly out with a helicopter, collect a little rock, and then you bring it back to a rover um, and then drop it off. But you can think it could be a human too, like, hey, helicopter, go collect that rock and bring it back to me. Let me see if it's worth trekking out there and risking my life to go collect another sample, right? right. So all those things are um, on the table. Great. Very interesting. Super interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, this one from Matthew. Uh, are there any parts on the new 3D rover that were printed in 3D? Ooh, I'm going to say yes. I don't remember exactly which parts they are. I believe the sample caching system, um, some of those parts were printed in 3D. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the rover wheels. I think those were um, milled out from a solid billet of uh, aluminum. Um, but we do a lot of 3D um, printing at JPL, and we're starting to using it to do more uh, prototyping of parts. Markups and prototyping. Yeah, probably. markups and prototypes. Yeah, very yeah. big because you know it, you know we have you know if there's anything that JPL does, it's it's custom you know one offs. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what we do. We innovate. Yeah. Um, we don't. We rarely replicate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think there are some parts I just, I apologize, I, I don't know exactly which are, but no I think problem. some of the sample caching system is um, uh, 3D printed. That's great. Okay, here's gonna be our last question. Um, it's kind of broad in, in its nature, but, uh, and you've talked about it already, but what is the future of GIS in space? Oh, um, what's the future? Uh, you know, um, a big push to 3D, um, you know, um, with the advent of things like uh, the GLTF, uh, modeling format, um, 3D tiles, um, you know, the, those are kind of the places where it's going. So, you know, uh, like the rest of the GIS field, right? I mean, 3D sure. is the thing, you know, and looking at, you know, also, um, you know, planetary is like, it's really funny because like on Earth, like we're talking about, you know, billions of points and our Mars, we're like thousands. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we're getting to the point where we're collecting up data that we are talking about, you know, um, uh, uh, not gigapixel, but uh, well, some gigapixel mosaics, but then, you know, uh, petabytes of data, yeah. um, you know, mapping all of Mars at 25 centimeters per pixel, you know, that'd be a huge data set. So basically going in that big data direction, looking at uh, voluminous data um, and then pushing in, in 3D and making it all interactive, uh, much like the rest of the field. Great. Thank you very much. Fred, I want to say thank you very much on behalf of everybody. We really appreciate your time with us. Appreciate you staying for questions and answers. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we're going we're gonna to 